Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Kant, Honorable Member of Parliament, Karthike Sharma, dignitaries, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am Rishabh Gulati, Managing Editor of NewsX, and I have the proud privilege of being your host this evening. One should not be afraid for the future, nor regret upon the past. Instead, one should with wisdom concentrate on utilizing the present to frame a brighter tomorrow. That was the advice passed down the ages in Kautilya's Arthashastra. So here we are today to remedy known concerns. And on that note, a welcome to you all to the first Law and Constitution Dialogue hosted by Legally Speaking and the ITV Network. We are immensely grateful that Justice Surya Kant is with us today to speak on the subject of constitutional morality, law and media. It's a core issue. As a TV journalist, I can safely say that we are more than just taking a long, hard look on whence we came and whither we go, and the valid concerns about what and how we do. To this effect, Legally Speaking is the visionary initiative and wholehearted brainchild of ITV Network's founder, Karthike Sharma, who is with us today. He's poured in purpose, energy, copious funds, thousands of print pages, and hundreds of hours of mainstream media time to create this platform. And this is just the beginning. We are gathered here today to launch LegallySpeakings.com and the Legally Speaking app, right now available for Android users, coming soon to your Apple Store. The graft and diligence that Tarun Nangya, editor special projects at ITV, has put in also is extremely notable, as well as our legal team coverage. Ashish is here, who's been doing a fantastic job. We have proudly created and curated India's only multimedia platform in the mainstream, solely dedicated to serving the community of jurists in print, in TV, and online. And what a proud opportunity it is to be here to take this to a new orbit. Tonight's proceedings are airing live on NewsX on television, and you can find a live stream on NewsX on YouTube or live TV links at newsx.com or legallyspeaking.com. Please also tweet if you are using the hashtag Legally Speaking. And as always, please, if you could keep your phones on silent during these proceedings. With that thought, could I request our dignitaries, Chief Guests Justice Surya Kant and Karthike Sharma ji to light the inaugural lamp? Could I also request our two editors, Tarun Nange and Ashish Sinha, to join them on stage and take their blessings? Ladies and gentlemen, I think you can greet this with a round of applause. It is, I promise you, I've done this for a very long time. What is being created here is something special. Thank you very much. Could I request our dignitaries and my colleagues to please take their seats? I'd now like to take the opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to give you a brief presentation to introduce to you what is it that we are doing here. Let's take the opportunity to have a look at our screens on the stage, please. are the mainstream media's dedicated platform to serve India's legal community. Ek desh, ek samvidhan, ek janda. One country, one constitution, one flag. That is the core of our democracy. The legal community is the core of the core. We are here to build a community in the mainstream media for you. A platform for jurists, with jurists and by jurists. We are doing what it takes Come join us and make this the go-to platform for serious news, 
views and conversations. 100 episodes of Legally Speaking have aired on NewsX, India's first and only primetime national television news show dedicated to the legal community. More than 100 dedicated columns published in the Sunday Guardian in print and online. More than 1,000 dedicated columns published in the Daily Guardian in print and online. And now presenting a dedicated website and a dedicated app. Today, law is a very popular profession. Today, a lot of people want to join the law. We need to meet the parameters of the offenses. With deep dives. In a constitutional court, there are lots of cross tensions. We have to have very good trained mediators of established reputation. With legal luminaries from across the world. How much can a person be surveilled in the future? This is a role of court. Unlike other countries, we have our two nations have a commitment. In-depth biographical interviews. I did huge number of cases. I, for the first three months in Cambridge, I was a very active debater. Full live primetime telecasts of the Ram Jaitmalani Memorial Lectures organized by Mahesh Jaitmalani. Overwhelming thank you to NewsX and the Sunday Guardian Foundation for not only telecasting live this event, but for the relentless publicity campaign that preceded it. Primetime telecasts of the Justice J.S. Varma Memorial Lecture organized by Vivek Tankha. Justice J.S. Varma, the iconic man of this place. Our aim is to curate quality conversations with eminent jurists which take forward jurisprudence, also inform, educate, stir debate. This is what has been our aim at Legally Speaking. We also take up relevant issues from time to time that involve uh, the future of the judiciary, also the court systems with eminent uh, retired judges, uh, also uh, former uh, ASGs, sitting ASGs, also eminent jurists. Uh, this is what we do on a weekly basis. Because in the end, we need to restore and renew the logic of the mainstream media, which is to raise the bar, not just sink beneath it. It is our duty to put on the national agenda the very important issues raised by jurists who play such an important role in so many path-breaking matters in the country. Legally speaking, the future of community service journalism in India's mainstream. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a brief presentation. As I said, this is just the beginning. So much more is yet to come. And with that thought, let me invite Honorable Member of Parliament, the Rajya Sabha and founder of the ITV Network, Karthike Sharma Ji, to present the welcome address. Karthike Ji. Honorable Mr. Justice Surikan Ji, dignitaries on the dais and off the dais, lawyers, judges, faculties, and students. It is an honor to have uh, Justice Surikan Ji, the sitting judge of Supreme Court of India, to speak at the inaugural Law and Constitution Dialogue. We look forward to hearing his words of wisdom on the topic of constitutional morality and law in media on the eve of Constitution Day. The topic of law in media reminds me of the bounden responsibility that the media has to report on courts in a neutral manner. Keeping this fact in mind, we started legally speaking six years ago with a television program, which has now spawned into an entire legal community comprising of legal shows, mobile app, online radio, website, and sections in the newspaper, The Daily Guardian and The Sunday Guardian. ITV Group is the only mainstream news media group in the country which has taken an initiative to cover legal issues, judgments, in-depth, eminent jurists, judges from India and the United States of America, law officers, Queen's Councils from the United Kingdom, have appeared on the network regularly over the past six years since Legally Speaking was started. As an extension to this platform, starting today, we have launched the Law and Constitution Dialogue. Justice Surya Kanji, who will be addressing the audience today, was born in 1962 in Hisar district in Haryana. He stood first in, first in class, first in law from Kurukshetra University and started his law practice in Hisar district, court of Haryana in 1984 and later shifted to Punjab and Haryana High Court in the year 1985. He represented many universities, boards, corporations, banks and government bodies in the High Court. He was appointed as the youngest Advocate General of Haryana on July 7, 2000 
and was designated uh, designated senior advocate in March 2001. Honorable Justice Surya Kanji held his held this office till his elevation as a permanent judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court on 9th January 2004. He was also nominated as a member of the National Legal Service Authority in February 2007 for two terms. In October 2018, he took as Chief Justice of Himachal Pradesh High Court and was shortly after elevated to the Supreme Court of India in May 2019. Honorable Justice Surikant has another engagement today, shortly after this speech. So without taking much time, I pursue, I pause my speech and hear and earnestly look forward to hear what Honorable Justice has to say. Thank you, sir, for taking out time and being here. Could I now request our Chief Guest, Honorable Justice Surya Kanji, to come forward with Karthiki Ji to launch the Legally Speaking website and app with the press of a remote button, please. The button is coming your way, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Again, I tell you, this is rather significant that is taking place. The website is live now and the app can be downloaded right now on, on Android and soon to be coming on the Apple Store as well. And with that, I will request our Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Kant, to present his Chief Guest's address on the topic of the first Law and Constitution Dialogue, which is Constitutional Morality, Law and Media. Sir. I find uh, in the distinguished audience my former Chief Justice, Honorable Mr. Justice Mukul Mudgul. I learnt a lot from him and I had the privilege to work under his leadership. Very old friend and known public figure of the state, Shri Vinod Sharmaji. A young, vibrant leader, Mr. Kartike Sharma. Again, my very old associate, Mr. Vivek Tankha, senior advocate. We worked together as Advocate General. At that time, he was Advocate General of Madhya Pradesh. We have among us Professor Askumar, Vice Chancellor. Very renowned personalities from the media. Distinguished members of the Supreme Court Bar, a very vibrant and uh, in true sense who speaks legally, Mr. Trun Nangia, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to speak on two subjects in a way of one sitting. Mr. Trun Nangi asked me to speak on the constitutional morality and as also on law and media. So I begin with my viewpoint on constitutional morality. Constitutional morality as a concept may be slightly difficult to define at the best of times. We have heard it invoked on numerous occasions in a series of judgments of great importance for the interpretation of the Constitution. The first citation of this concept predates our time by almost 50 years when Justice A. N. Roy and Justice Jagan Mohan Reddy first floored the notion of constitutional morality in one of the most celebrated adjudications in case one and Bharti case. The thrust of the notion of constitutional morality in case one and Bharti appears to be in terms of adherence to democratic values. As we know, the constitution is the foremost document that seeks and works to uphold democracy, the rule of law, and the fundamental rights of citizens. 
the importance of constitutional morality was also mentioned repeatedly in NCT Delhi versus Union of India, where different opinions were authored by different judges, referring to constitutional morality as a check upon state functionaries and citizens. The general idea of constitutional morality that has emerged over time is one which seeks to uphold values believed to be enshrined in our constitution. While these values may be traced to part three of the constitution, it appears that there could certainly be other sources from which constitutional morality is derived. Undoubtedly, in the spirit of what Baba Sahib Ambedkar had mentioned, a part of constitutional morality is forward looking. It seeks to transform Indian society into the state and institutions that are committed to democratic ideals and goals. Let's remember that at that time, India was emerging from colonialism and marching towards becoming a fully functional democratic state. The constitution, therefore, was meant to act as a stimulant to propel the country forward in its search for the appropriate balance between its many conflicting obligations. The key point that requires our consideration is that once the nation has attained such goal to an extent where does the transformative or forward-looking policy take us? It seems that a visionary like Baba Sahib Ambedkar never meant to stop and be satisfied as soon as the objective of democratization of society was attained. A country must constantly transform and rework into in order to keep up with the changing world. Our social mores, economic concepts, and ideas regarding what constitutes a healthy, tolerant, and pluralistic society will perpetually keep changing as time goes on. One component of constitutional morality is thus the progress and betterment of society. However, here is where I draw a small but crucial distinction. Constitutional morality, even as it moves forward and seeks to uplift members of society, who have unfortunately been downtrodden for decades, cannot remain diverse from the society which it seeks to govern. A constitution cannot be aspirational, not only aspirational, but it cannot be oblivious to the realities of the world. What I wish to say is that constitution acts as a medium for betterment of the people and helps people pursue the goals that they have laid down for themselves. To interpret the constitution in a different way would be reminiscent of the way our country was ruled by the British colonizers for two centuries. During those times, the modes and attitude of the ruling class was completely detached from the population over which it presided. The reason for this is simple. The British were concerned purely with ruling democracy and its ideals of inclusiveness were the last thing on their mind. Here is where I draw the distinction between ruling and governance. A state which rules over its people is one that is indifferent to the desires of the people over whom it controls. This is not the case anymore. Now that we have achieved self-governance, I see no reason to mimic the attitude of our erstwhile colonial masters. Constitutional morality must be responsive and receptive to the people as is norm for states where the people are governed. This brings me to another point that requires consideration in terms of constitutional morality. The constitution that was envisaged by the founders partly resembles the Government of India Act 1935. As we are well aware, the intention behind this act was to ensure the greatest degree of control by our colonial administrators who were insensitive to the rights of the people. Contrary to 1935 Act, our constitution is an instrument of public welfare 
and the ethos and morality behind it are more fundamentally different this makes it even more important for us to conjoin constitutional morality with the values that are in the veins of indian society for centuries in that sense constitutional morality is a legal representation of our dharma our values our ethics and social moralities which we have passed protected and promoted for thousands of years our commitment to righteousness will guide our path forward from being a country that has now embedded democratic instincts into society and which emphasizes economic and technological development and innovation our societal values will assist us in coming conveying the importance of honoring the rule of law in this nation that is the progressive forward motion that the constituent assembly had visualized while articulating constitutional morality our jurisprudence on constitutional morality has been focused largely on social aspects but given the steps we have taken in this regard we can now expand our understanding of constitutional morality into other areas as well constitutional morality should not be limited to social and political arena but also include areas such as technology and economics we must innovate not only in technical field such as engineering and medicine but also in our law in that i believe that we will be guided by the centuries old self evolved morals that have steered our society in its times of darkness and light an example that i often take is the decision made during the covid-19 pandemic to share our vaccines with the rest of the world this was especially important in poorer regions where resources to inoculate the population were not easily and readily available this is not just a governmental decision but a decision that outlines our traditional values of solidarity and sharing and as you know sarve bhavantu sukhine sarve santu niramaya meaning thereby may all be happy and free from illness we are not driven by self gain and profit but by self sufficiency that is aimed to uplift both ourselves and the people around us this extends not just to our fellow indians but to any person in need regardless of race class background and religion there is no question of our traditional values not being in conformity with progressive values constitutional morality must not proceed on the basis that any contradiction exists between itself and our time tested values the question of a conflict in fact does not arise at all how we navigate this territory and understand the ways in which constitutional morality is shaped will be a social and societal level decision it cannot and should not be the determination of single individuals hence when expounding on the nature of constitutional morality we must always keep the people in mind this does not mean we make constitutional morality equal to or subservient to societal norms not at all merely responsive to them the young students particularly will be aware in international law there is a concept known as the ethic of responsibility this is derived primarily from the private international law a body of rules developed in international law to deal with conflicts between different systems or branches of law the concept recognizes that no one system should overrule the other but that there must be a mutual accommodation this enables multiple different laws to be applied in a hypothetical situation where disputes have arisen between two parties i believe we need an ethic of responsibility in our jurisprudence on constitutional morality our rulings must respond to way our society economy and morals develop and i clarify once again i do not think of any of these as monolithic all of these factors vary significantly 
and constantly across time and space. That in fact further proves the point that a pluralistic society is necessarily and inherently a diverse one. The manner of accommodating this diversity is what will determine the future of our constitutional jurisprudence and how constitutional morality evolves. At its highest, I firmly believe that the concept can provide illumination for the journey ahead, but it requires us to constantly open and responsive to the trajectories of the future. I am delighted to have been able to share my these thoughts very briefly on the issue of constitutional morality. Thank you very much. Thank you. The second subject is a little problematic, I think. <laughs> the law and media. But I have tried to say something and I hope that you will appreciate it. What I feel is that law and media are part of the same mosaic of essential components and are fundamental to a sustainable and healthy democratic society. We always implore legal fraternity to implement and uphold the law with the greatest power to ensure that the citizens of the country continue to have faith in the rule of law and the systems that regulate and protect their rights and duties. Now on the same pedestal and the same analogy, the media is under an onerous responsibility to report the truth and ensure it adheres to the highest tenets of good faith, integrity and propriety. The state of legal reporting itself has grown by leaps and bounds, starting from the Indian Law Reports Act 1875 to the present day technological age with numerous databases and legal news reporting websites our ability to convey the specifics of law to the masses has remarkably improved. There are two types of forms that have arisen in this digital age. One being the forms that are useful for those in the legal profession itself. Say for example, you have SEC, Manu Patra, LexisNexis and so on. The second kind of form, which is where I place legally speaking at a very high pedestal and thanks to Mr. Trun Nangia the way he presents the programs every day, very lively programs. Live lie is also one other form and there are so many others. These are the avenues for common men to learn about law, legal opinion and court judgments. In our day and age, the demystification of law is the need of the hour. The untrained legal mind also needs to understand the law as everyone is impacted by it. To that extent, the articles and YouTube videos that are produced by Legally Speaking and similar websites are taking law to people which is an indispensable public service. Legal reporting websites and forums are our first responders. Law reportage is often the one and only access that a lay person has to the goings on at court and in the legal world. These updates are relied upon by them to know how their behavior needs to be shaped and what are their rights, etc. Reporting is also of great importance to the dear law students and the faculty in colleges and universities. Many of the videos produced by Legally Speaking are informative tools that can be used in classrooms as a way to introduce a topic to students. And of course, we the judges and the senior members of the bar sitting here, all advocates, fraternity, also stand to gain from the reporting that helps as a ready reckoner and is a way to keep track of what is happening in both the Supreme Court or the lower courts. At times, important legal developments 
that have an impact on pending cases are also first di discovered through these reporting websites only. Now please, I have tried to s say something here. Journalism, as I understand, is a form of art. Anything that steers our senses, the heart, mind and soul can be defined as art and so to an extent journalism may also be considered as an art form. Some may not fully agree with this notion on the basis that all that a journalist does is just deliver the facts. However, herein lies the key, the way one delivers those facts makes all the difference. The media through its sensitive reportage of events and its absorbing ability to analyze the facts in a social and political context engages us in a form of literary, literary art that is a mode of storytelling. As sometimes I have been saying to the young law students also and to young, particularly young lawyers also in, in the matter of drafting and my Chief Justice has also been guiding them in some small level seminars we have been organizing and high courts that drafting itself is like something a fictional writing and so will happen with a journalist. You have to disclose the truth but in such a manner that the person who starts reading will not stop, he will reach up to the end and will understand that story fully. So that is an art and that's why I said that it's a mode of storytelling. These heartening stories have often led to the upliftment of the marginalized and downtrodden across the world and given them a voice. To capture human emotions and experiences in this way, in this rowest form and to tell us the stories of those people is nothing short of overwhelming artistic. However, journalism must also lead us to the truth. Incorrect statements and distorted versions can never be considered art. Therefore, only true journalism, which includes a rigorous process to ensure veracity of the facts which are reported and a responsible and balanced way of conveying these facts is deserving of that categorization of art form. The importance of a free press has been acknowledged time and again in the legal field. Professor John Stuart Mill a titan of free speech jurisprudence and its importance to democracy had formulated a three-pronged theory to explain the importance of free speech in a democratic polity. First, it helps evolve and identi identify the truth. Second, it bolsters good governance and democracy. Third, it promotes individual autonomy. Let's refresh ourselves that the freedom of the press was deemed to be implicit with Article 19.1a of the Constitution in the landmark cases delivered by Supreme Court in Circle Papers and then in Virendra Singh v. State of Punjab. Since that time, the press has largely been self-regulating. In principle, there is nothing wrong in that approach. However, when the freedom of the press is used in a manner that impeaches on others' fundamental rights, such as the right to dignity and the right to privacy, we must introspect on the balancing of these rights. It is well known that in our constitutional scheme, the right guaranteed under Article 21 are placed on a higher pedestal than those safeguarded under Article 19. Dear friends, you will agree that a completely unregulated media can be problematic. The Supreme Court in PUCL had elaborated on the right to get information that was accurate as part of the right to free speech and expression. It was further noted in D.C. Saxena's case that a duty exists not to interfere with or denigrate the rights of others in line with what I mentioned earlier, responsible reporting that conforms to basic tenets of integrity and decency is crucial and hallmark of true journalism. This approach is quite common across the world. So it's not that in India only that this kind of expectations are there. A much stronger view has been taken in European countries in favor of protecting an individual's dignity and privacy, including that of people 
who are deceased. For example, in famous Mephisto judgment in which the German constitutional court found the right to dignity to have primacy under the German basic law and that it would apply even to a deceased person. The attempt to optimally balance these rights is a continuous process and India is not immune to these requirements of balancing. So with this in mind, how should we view the state of the media today? That's the question. The answer depends on the ways in which media has evolved. Technology has facilitated news being delivered in various mediums that were not available just 10 years ago. The age of smartphones, portable devices and social media has created a new digital ecosystem which all of us are required to navigate. There is a unique culture that has sprung up from this. With a smartphone in hand and a YouTube channel, you can report from any part of the world and telecast it to hundreds, potentially thousands in no time. However, with any rapid advancement or change in society, there are caveats. One such caveat that I want to highlight before you this evening is the rise of clickbait media, which offers up a somewhat deceptive, sensational and misleading version of a story to attract more viewers and readers to the content. The objective here is not to educate, to inspire, but to gain clicks. The makers will do anything to get your attention. Every time someone is lured into it, we are assisting in the growth of this form of media. The greatest drawback of this kind of unverified and irresponsible reporting is not only its effect on certain specific institutions, but also the degree to which it adversely impacts journalism and media itself. In more cases than one, the content does not even match the headline, hence the loss of faith and trust. The point on which I want to emphasize is that the media has a heightened responsibility due to the greater power that it enjoys, the power to shape the views and attitudes of hundreds of millions. At each instance, the media may put in more efforts to make use of the enormous resources at their disposal to go to that extra mile in ensuring that their reportage meets the highest standards of probity and morals and emerges as a living example of art. That's why I said that journalism is an art. In legal reporting, the accurate and actual contents of judgments need to be ensured. The importance of this cannot be understated as other ordinary citizens rely on such reports to know about the state of the law and how to act accordingly. I believe that the vast majority, the good, fair and sharp journalists and media titans, such as those, some of who are present here today and those journalists who are in making are the ones who will shape the institution of journalism for years to come. I firmly believe that once we dig deeper into ourselves, we will find that our unity lies in our adherence to truth. That truth is what we depend upon you to deliver us. In that spirit, I openly rely upon the famous words of Edward R. Murray, one of the pioneers of broadcast television and journalism as he urged us to remain focused in our search for the truth and reject any sensational and deceptive news. What he says and I quote, We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. We must remember always that accusation is not proof and that conviction depends upon evidence and due process of law. We will not walk in fear one of another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason if we dig deep in our history and our doctrine and remember that we are not descended from fearful men, not from men who fear to write, to speak, to associate and to defend causes that were for the moment unpopular." Unquote. These cautionary words of advice apply across time and across societies. I would conclude by saying that may integrity, 
humility honesty and responsibility lead us forward in clarity unit and justice thank you very much thank you jai hind mr justice thank you very much i think you given me and many others here some food for thought very grateful sir with that could i request our editor special projects tarun nangya to kindly deliver the vote of thanks good evening all of you and i would like to thank uh, justice suryakant uh, from the bottom of my heart but i would also like to share an anecdote with all of you of how legally speaking is a true product of haryana and uh, i'll we'll go back in 2016 uh, what happened then is uh, dr anudag batra who runs a media house he introduced me to kartikeya sharma uh, who runs another media house who is from haryana and of course now honorable mp uh, he used to run a media house then i wanted to do a show interviewing industrialists because i know those kind of people well kartikeya sharma told me tarun i'll give you something even more better go and interview judges so i said that's never been done and i don't think that it will be you know i can do it uh then what happens is i end up meeting mr ryan karanjawala who sent me to the chandigarh judicial academy those days he said jaake dekho wahan pe you interact with judges and lawyers and you might be able to do something what happened then is i met justice surakant there for the first time and he'll remember and bear me out and there was a discussion mediation and we had lunch over lunch uh, he shared with me that why don't you start your show from the issue of mediation so uh, uh, kartikeya sharma ji who's from haryana justice surakant who's from haryana now the first guest on the show justice arjun kumar sikri was sitting judge of supreme court was earlier the chief justice of punjab haryana high court he became the first guest so there is a lot of haryana in 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 the show so haryana has a lot of contribution in making legally speaking what it is and of course uh, mr karanja wala represented mr bhajan lal a lot of times he was a three time chief minister of haryana so so you know <laughs> but uh, but uh, last but not the least uh, uh, life changes and you know things have a way of working out as i remember the address by steve jobs uh, when he gave his address in his university long years ago he said that you can connect your life only going backwards you cannot connect your life going forward that is what at there was a commencement lecture at his university and so i i connect my life only going backwards because i had nowhere i had even dreamt that i would live to see the day when justice surakant will be in the supreme court of india so i have to say things have a way of working out i thank him from the bottom of my heart for all the guidance and all the ideation of uh, the chairman of the itv group uh, mr kartikeya sharma thank you so very much thank you so very much for more such videos subscribe to the newsx youtube channel hit the bell icon